At the end of last week, the FBI arrested the man they allege made more than a half dozen threats against Jewish centers in New York City. Now, the name may be familiar to Brick TV viewers. Juan Thompson. He appeared on a Brick Be Heard Town Hall on youth violence in June of 2015, as well as an episode of Straight Up. Now, Juan's arrest was all over the news this weekend, but we're going to start today's show by going past the headlines to some of the larger concerns raised by this and other events, and how they relate to mental health and our national political dialogue. Now, it's a tall order, so we invited the man who wrote the book on mental illness and political protest, a familiar voice here at BK Live, Dr. Jonathan Metzel. Welcome back, sir. Thank you so much. It's nice to be here. Thank you for being here, Jonathan. Welcome back. Okay, so your book, The Protest Psychosis, right, it delves into the history of the political abuse of psychiatry. But how could the current political environment affect someone who is mentally unstable? So kind of going reverse a roux there. Right. Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a, uh, well, let's start more broadly. It's a kind of natural human tendency in moments of political upheaval or stress to scapegoat other people. Uh, many people do it on a kind of small everyday level. Um, and really only a small percentage of people who have this sense of kind of, well, gosh, I feel uncertain, I feel bad about myself, act in any way that leads to homophobia, Islamophobia, racism, anti-Semitism. Um, unfortunately, those kind of tendencies are exacerbated, particularly among people who are at high risk risk during moments of political stress, upheaval, uncertainty. And certainly, I think a lot of the books on kind of this kind of projection and displacement are being rewritten uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the current political climate. But I think the other part that's important to note is that um, this is not a question of mental illness per se. In other mm -hmm. words, people, uh, people who commit things like hate crimes or these kind of harassment episodes, mm -hmm. they require a lot of planning, right? And so uh, there's a lot of kind of executive function that needs to go into it. And so you're not really talking about people with severe schizophrenia or mm -hmm. depression. Right. These are really generally people who are aggrieved, uh, uh, you know, paranoid, feel like the world. To grind exactly, kind of something like that. And so in a way, what, what we see is that um, these kind of things intersect, which is people who have a natural tendency toward these kind of um, these kind of projections or scapegoating, then will be given permission by a larger political climate. And certainly mm -hmm. in the present moment where we've got, um, you know, a government running on blaming other people and things like that, it's not in any way surprising for me and other people who study this that we're seeing a rise in hate crimes and other kinds of hate acts. So looking mm -hmm. at uh, this instance in particular and some of the vandalism that's happened at some uh, cemeteries, mm -hmm. as well as the attacks Chinese on, Museum. like, Sikh mm -hmm. people in, what, Kansas was the right. latest one, Kansas. where people are actually being threatened and hurt and shot mm -hmm. in some instances. How important is it that someone like a Donald Trump come out and say, not cool, not on my watch, this isn't the America that I want to be the leader of. It's hugely important. In other words, what we need at this moment is leadership, leadership that we're not getting. So we need not just Donald Trump. I mean, obviously, Donald Trump is the figurehead, but the government needs to come out and say, this is this is not tolerated. This is not who we are as Americans. We have a diverse, multicultural society. And the fact that, that, that it's taken so much prodding for the government to even make even the most base right. uh, um, case, this case is obviously uh, one case among many. Uh, it's horrible and tragic, but it's tied to desecration of Jewish cemeteries. It's tied to attacks on uh, people of, uh, you know, kind of other groups, as we're seeing. And so the circle just keeps widening. Mm -hmm. And in a way, what's happening is we're seeing, I think, a vacuum of leadership that's really perpetuating this. The government needs to take a strong stand, and it's, and it's clearly not doing so. Right. No, and it, it's actually perpetuating the opposite, right? Vilifying immigrants and immigrant communities and doing all that it can to say, we're going to do what we can for the victims of immigrant criminals right. rather than mm -hmm. the other. Right. No, and, and also the government itself, I think in a lot of the rhetoric itself seems to be claiming that it is the victim, right? And so, mm -hmm. in a way, this just plays into this sense that, um, you know, we're, we're under attack. But the problem and is we, we have see— we to take matters into our own hands. Exactly. And the, what we see is that the circle just keeps growing, right? And so— So, as evidenced by your book and the sort of dark history of the way that the field of psychiatry treated some people of color and marginalized groups, is there something that you would impart on those communities now, whether they're being marginalized in the political climate or have historically been 
that would bring them to the field to say, okay, things are different now if they are in fact, or how to seek help if someone close to you or you yourself might be experiencing some of these thoughts? Well, that's a great question. I think there are two parts to that question. One is just to ask why is it that communities of color distrust mental health, the mental health fields? Mm -hmm. And I think part of the issue, as I show in my book, The Protest Psychosis, part of the issue um, is that there's a long history of using basically um, usually black political protest right. to delegitimize larger political political movements right. in a certain kind of way. So we saw this with Malcolm. Say they're crazy. Exactly. Right. We called Malcolm and aggressive X. Aggressive yeah, and hateful. Exactly. And so we didn't have to we don't have to listen to what they're saying. And so we Malcolm X wanted guns for self protection. Oh, that's mental illness. Um, Huey Newton, the Black Panthers. In other words, what happens is there's a larger history of using the rhetoric of mental illness to delegitimize entire valid civic movements. And I think we're seeing this again now, unfortunately, in the aftermath of what happened with Mr. Thompson, uh, that people are trying to tie this to Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. to larger mm -hmm. things. It's actually not related no. in any way mm -hmm. at all. Um, and so, partially, the rhetoric of mental illness has been used to squelch, right. you know, black strivings for civil yeah, rights, yeah, in a way. And so, that, there's certainly that. And then the other part is just, I don't think the mental health communities have done a good enough job of reaching out, uh, reaching out, in other words, like we used to call this in the old days, mm. white norms of psychiatric diagnosis. That in a way, the idea of what mental illness is, is, um, you know, is the person who can buy an antidepressant on right. an advertisement. Afford therapy. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so I think that in a way there are, pu there are pushes within psychiatry right now to mm -hmm. say, let's actually look at not just about, you know, the serotonin balance or who can afford Prozac or something. It's also like, what about racism? Does that cause mental illness? What about being oppressed? What about the factors like that? And so in a way, these are important, challenging questions for mental health. Short Absolutely. answer, yes. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> PhD or yes. Jonathan, it's never We're enough time, time, but we are yeah. out of time with you. Thank you so Thank much for joining us. My everyone. pleasure to be continued.